All right, welcome back to the fifth episode of the Victor One podcast. This week, featuring a well-renowned aviation photographer Graham Hutchinson, also known as One Six Right Media, where he'll come to discuss some of his his career in aviation photography, um, any tips on photography. Um, and joining me as always is my co-host Calvin. How are you going? I'm very well, thank you. Um, yeah, um, let's get started. So. Um, Graham, talk, tell me about yourself, like how you got into photography and obviously aviation journalism. I guess just aviation in general to start with. I probably from about seven or eight years old, we lived near Archerfield in Brisbane. So I used mm-hmm. to watch the, the, the moths doing you know, spins and recoveries and all that sort of thing. And I, I think that sort of sparked something as far as aviation was concerned. And then over the years, like when I got to uh, mid-teens, I, I sort of had a, a yearning to, to learn to fly. And I did that with the intention of trying to get into Qantas as a cadet. Applied for that. I wasn't successful. They used to take 20 out of 2,000 applicants back then. That was about 1970. So it was pretty hard to get in. But anyway, I was learning to fly to do that. In photography, probably in the, in the about the same time, you know, late, late teens at uni, at Sydney Uni, I was uh, a member of the photography society so I learned uh, back then there was it was all film so learning how to process film and you know wind your own film so it's you know like 50 foot rolls and wind it onto little 24 exposure spools yeah so the the photography took off and initially doing motor racing but then very quickly onto aviation and uh, meeting you know a whole lot of the guys who were around back then who were a lot older than me but um yeah there was some great people out there photographing at the time and you know uh, film photography very different to these days with digital photography sort of stuff by comparison the uh, sort of career was I was in IT so because I didn't get into Qantas so I went to uni uh, did IT worked at the U- University of New South Wales for 15 years mm-hmm. so I know the university very well uh, my uh, son's just finished his uh, computer science course th- last year then uh, from the uni I went into the pharmaceutical uh, industry in IT, so I had a, about 27 years in pharmaceuticals with Roche, a ph- global pharmaceutical company, and uh, a great time. <laughs> it was one of the best companies to work for, so it let me do a lot of things, a lot of travel, in which case I would have geek out at all the different airports I go to mm-hmm. and spend a weekend before meetings, photographing uh, and what have you. So then I hadn't flown for quite a while, and in 2006 I decided to fly again. So got back into it and uh, a little bit of venturing around there, not too far out to Orange, down to Canberra, those sorts of, you know, fairly one and two hour type trips from, from Bankstown, yeah. up Phoenix and, and Victor Ones and what have you. So, yeah. And then finally I'm retired now, so I spend all my time. Um, I don't know whether you call it journalism, <laughs> but it's quite fun. The, the social media is just so, so amazing these days, what you can do and, you know, what you can achieve with it. And the connections you can make, which are, are, you know, connections are everything, networking with people. It's the only way to, you know, to get to do things that are a little bit special, a little bit different. Yeah. It's social media has been, been fantastic. Yeah, no, awesome. Now, I think you um, yeah, have a very um, well, good overview of your career and also your, how you got into photography. And just in terms of getting into IT, I suppose, is that something that you did more so because you already had that um, interest in photography? And is that just why you, why you wanted to do that? Because... Or is that just something that you did because you weren't really sure about what you wanted to do? I think so. When I first went to uni, I went to Sydney Uni and was doing aeronautical engineering because I thought that was the next best thing to being a pilot. So, you know, pilot didn't look like it was happening. It, the, the second time I applied for Qantas, there was the world, a world fuel crisis then. So the cadet scheme actually got shut down. So, you know, there was sort of no, no future at short term anyway with, uh, with flying. Um, so I was doing aeronautical engineer, uh, engineering and then... I guess realised that wasn't quite my thing and uh, ended up moving to New South Wales Uni and doing the IT course there. They had quite a good IT uh, computer uh, science department then and, and it was really the start of computing. It was, it was all mainframes, you know, no PCs, um, hardly a microprocessor until I was probably in you know, third year or something like that. So quite primitive computer-wise, but it was a, a basically... I probably tracked, you know, right through the the world of IT from the very start almost, not the the very, very start, but, you know, from when things were really quite starting to be commercial and companies had mainframe computers, um, you know, as part of their their, uh, their processing and and what have you. So, uh, yeah, it was was just 
uh, a step that I, and when I started programming, I did a little bit of programming at, as part of uh, aeronautical engineering and it really just seemed to click for me as being, mm -hmm. yeah, my brain worked that way or whatever. I had a, a, maybe a natural flair to do that. And so that's where I took that as far as I could um, education wise and then um, just working generally in IT at the university and then with, with Roche. Yeah, no, I can, um... No, it was good that you, I suppose you developed, you developed that sort of passion and it worked. I see, yeah. and you said that you also got to travel the world, travel, um, different places as well, which obviously filled that, um, um, or fueled that passion for photography as well. Um, and it's something that I suppose you would say kept you going, is just being able to travel all these different places and wanting to see different types of airplanes, airports. You'd say that's something that kept you going along the way. Yeah, it was in terms of interesting because, uh, you know, some of the, the things you do at work and particularly with Roche, they you know, you have meeting, team meetings and things like that. And I can remember several people commenting, commenting to me to say they thought it was so good that I actually had, and apart from, you know, being passionate about work and IT, I actually had this second passion, which was flying and, and photography. And a number of people there, they, like they, they didn't have that. They had, you know, th there was no one thing that they were really passionate about outside of work. And so it really sort of struck a chord with me how, how amazing that was in a sense that I could have two really passionate things going on at the same time and, you know, both sort of full steam type things. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and in terms of, of, and in terms of obviously from it initially becoming just something that you used to do, you used to go living near Archfield, like you said, when you were a kid, and then having that, obviously that fascination with aeroplanes from wanting to be a pilot yourself, what I'd say... But what, 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 how was like that progression from going just from that thing that you did? Like, say, for example, like I, if I might have a Saturday off or something, I might go to Sheps or something like that because I like looking at the airplanes there. But then for you, something that you essentially do now, especially in your retirement, what, how did you progress from that stage from just wanting to go then looking at the airplanes to full on? Obviously, people said you had a passion for it and you liked photography. How did you go from essentially just taking those photos to becoming this sort of like well renowned figure in the aviation community, particularly on, um, particularly not only Instagram, but um, the Facebook pages of Australian aircraft photography, photography, the countless of them. How did you get from that stage to progressing to all the way to there? We're becoming this world-renowned sort of photographer in the industry. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, initially it just started off as, as um, trying to photograph everything, you know, no matter where I went, um, I spent a lot of time down in Essendon um, and and Marine as well. And you know, just trying to get shots of all the different aircraft. Um, but because I was, uh, you know, you sort of working at the time, you really only had time. I would miss all the, you know, all the fancy airlines or aircraft that came in as, as specials. I couldn't always get to see those unless they were on a weekend. So that's the joy now of being retired. <laughs> you can go and catch everything you want. So it was really, um, I, I, you know, I had al album after album of all these different, you know, international airlines, local airlines, light aircraft choppers, the whole thing. And, you know, with, with prints, you can imagine that, you know, after a while it gets a bit, a bit hard to deal with because they just take up so much room. They don't last, you know, they'll, they'll, over years, I mean, 30 years later, some of the prints, you know, they're starting to fade. I probably should have done slides. I mean, a lot of the guys that have got slides have images now that are pretty darn good compared to 30 years ago. They've, they've lasted well. So yeah, it did that. And then it just got more intense, really. Um, I, I got more opportunities through work to be different places, to catch different aircraft. Um, I always tried to, you know, to get into things, um, you know, whether it was something, at some sort of event at Qantas or, or whatever that might be, even, even out of Bankstown, I'd, I'd, you know, walk around the aprons, talk to people in the hangars, you know, you mm -hmm. start to get to know people and, and that's that's where it really opens doors mm -hmm. to allow you to get to access things or, be, you know, participate in things that you wouldn't normally yeah. do. And I guess now, like when uh, probably, what is it, like the last 10 years or a little bit more than that with social media, you know, it starts off slowly. And uh, I mean, initially it was, I was using the, the Sydney Airport message board as a, a sort of forum to spread the photos. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, Twitter and then finally Instagram, which I, I found Instagram just amazing. I, I was reluctant to start. My son sort of pushed me to say, have a give it a go. But I think I've made so many more connections and there's so much more, um, uh, you know, talking with people. I get information from people all the time, you know, lots of direct messages and telling me things that are happening. There's aircraft, different aircraft coming. 
So you yeah. the sort of information that you wouldn't get, you know, normally. Yeah, the, the, the social media just then really intensified everything because it, the audience can be whatever. I mean, Twitter's, Twitter seems a little bit more, you know, business, commercial, newsy sort of media, whereas Instagram is just, I don't know, it's just got a nice balance and I've sort of ended up focusing on that quite a bit more. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've always wondered, um, um, especially when um, um, some of different types of aircraft coming, particularly recently with all the repatriation flights, um, uh, talking about like the KLM 777, the Saudi 777 ER, and then the 787 from the other day. I've always wondered how, apart, obviously, for me, without these connections, I usually refer to the photography pages and that's what people say, this is coming in. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, but yeah, apart from that, unless I'm on flight radar and I see something coming down, I'm not really going to see it. it. I know there's obviously your friends with a guy called Tim Bowery who works out oh. um, yeah, Sydney Airport, and he obviously, I think, yeah, he works with all the different aeroplanes there. Obviously, with putting parking the aeroplanes runway two five and one. Is he? Um, and like uh, you said, is that so? That's pretty much how you receive all that. All this information is just from them. He would know all these different aeroplanes that are coming in, and then other people who are either pilots or work for these airlines. Is that how pretty much how you get this information? Um, sort of two sources really. The the, the primary one is um, just some of the contacts that I've developed over the years. Um, so I have people in New Zealand. You know, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide. So they, they, they sometimes they work for airlines, so they have access to systems to know what's coming up in the next. You know, what's actually got a flight plan in to come here or whatever. So you know, every every morning I wake up, sort of, you know, what's going to happen today. Other one, the second one's probably technology because it's been amazing what you can do. My son and I both being IT, um, he does all the programming now, and I sort of help or you know think do the think tank stuff to design, but you know, I get automatically get uh, entries going into my calendar of when flight plans go into the system. So I can target either a specific aircraft. Um, I like the corporate jets. So, you know, any corporate jet heading for Sydney just pops up on my calendar um, overnight and I can have a look through that and see, you know, when I can, you know, what time I need to be around to catch um, it. And then there's all the, you know, people at the airport. So whether it's Tim, who's, you know, will pass on information if he's got a know something about a special aircraft coming in. And uh, we also have a, a WhatsApp group uh, with some of the guys down there. So Nigel, who's that airfield guy, and Kurt and Seth, who's a, you know, a, a excellent photographer. He's been photographer of the year a few times uh, for aviation. All of um, these guys, so, you know, it's from sort of people in the business, uh, even uh, people on, on Insta now. Um, I'm just getting more and more people contacting me and saying, oh, did you know this was happening? And, you know, it's, it's really quite good. So plenty of, plenty of sources to get that. Um, but you have to be so organised, you know, like you have to know where to be. You've got to be aware of the runways mm -hmm. that are in use. You know, what's the going to be like tomorrow morning? Am I going to be, you know, uh, photographing on 1634, whichever runway might be active, deciding whether you're going to do video or still shots. Um, you know, they're, they're both... They're both really good mediums, so you really want to uh, choose what's the best one to do. And so that that what may turn out to be the last Qantas 747 flight that came in from Santiago, I decided to do that on video because you know it's a, it's a lot more powerful to see a, a you know the, the plane actually landing in real time sort of thing mm -hmm. rather than you know three or four still shots of that. So that's for a historic event like that, you know, video is a really great medium to use. So I just mix it up depending on you know what. Um, what I think is the best way to, to, to capture what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I really, I really enjoy your um, your Qantas retirement videos. Um, you have the music yeah, playing yeah. in the background as well, as well. But um, yeah, no, um, I just had one um, quick question, and then I think Alvin wanted to ask something. Is that at Sydney, um, in terms of the in terms of the best spotting location, uh, I probably frequent Sheps the most because it's probably easiest to get to. Obviously, going to behind ikea there gone through there's like a hole in the fence mm. there's a few of them but i um, mean you go to the ridges of course as well and then there's also near the beach there but what if, what would be what's the most ideal place in terms of not only in terms of viewing angle of the aircraft uh, but uh, also in terms of light and whatnot and all that other stuff yeah so it really depends on the time of day so and, and this is one of the things i, I get uh, from uh, some of the pilots that will contact me ahead of time and say i'm flying in you know on wednesday you know can you get some photos or video or whatever and you know they don't realize you know it all depends on the weather if they're coming in at seven in the morning and the runway is three four i mean the only place you can shoot the touchdown is from the beach yeah. and you're looking straight into the sun so you know it's not really ideal conditions to do that so generally it's, you know, in the mornings you'd be on the, the eastern side of the runways, wherever that might be, whether that's Sheps or, or the domestic car park around at um, 
the mill stream or port botany there's all locations around that you can be on the you know the, have the sun behind you and illuminating the aircraft mm -hmm. and then in the the afternoon, you know, you want to be on the western side of the runway, so the beach, uh, the international car park, or the ridges locations there. Quantas Drive, you can sort of work your site either way, and then in the afternoon as well, IKEA. So it's it's really a case of you know what time of day, whether it's morning or afternoon, and, and just what sort of shots you want. So you know, I'm, something that's really a, a good place I like is the is the international car park if they're using one on six in the afternoon because that way you can actually video the or you know or shoot the uh, aircraft coming in with the city backdrop uh, you get the touchdown yes. in front of you and then you get a taxi back up hopefully if it comes to one of the gates below you um, or if it's a freighter it'll definitely come there so you get this whole range of you know telling a story rather than having three shots that just show a touchdown or something like that so that's that's what i try and do is not just have a you know a one or two shot of a particular thing, it's to have a bit of a story to it. So, um, and people seem to like that. They like, they like um, get lots of good feedback about the detailed shots that I take, uh, generally through the fence. But you know, when aircraft park on uh, Bay Ninety Nine uh, around at uh, GA, yep. they, uh, they're quite close to the fence there. And so, you know, you can get very, very detailed shots of you know shutting down the engines and whatever it might be. Uh, yeah, no. cargo, and yeah. So there's great. There seems you know real appetite for looking at all those sorts of things and telling that story of what actually you know why were they here what were they doing sort of thing so that's and that's that's a you know it's quite a fun thing to do that it's like sort of being paparazzi in a sense you know you're racing around trying to find you know where's a good story and there's not just a photograph yeah no exactly i remember even when the um the french airbus um the 400 came the other day I remember he took photos there, also the Air New Zealand, not Air New Zealand, so the New Zealand 75 from um, the political one, Park Sarah sometimes as well. Yes. Or if there's a challenger or something, you, you know, I've seen those ones a lot. Oh, yeah, in all of that location, I just remember the ridges. I wish I went to the car park that day that OJU left because I remember I went there. It's the final OJ and I got really hyped up to see it. And I was at Sheps and then as soon as it, I think maybe even from like one of your videos, you can see there's a tiger. A320 the past you don't see it and everyone's upset and yeah, yeah, um, yeah different those different locations are definitely are definitely good for that reason yeah, and it doesn't matter where you go you know from ships you quite often you'll get a, an aircraft taxi right in front of you when the you know the aircraft you're trying to shoot is taking off on the main runway and yeah mm -hmm. i had that with the the embraer um, 195e2 when that was here the demonstrator Mm -hmm. And we all went round to the mound to get it going off, and literally, I got nothing of it because it, it took off at the, at the same exact pace as an aircraft taxiing along Charlie. So you know, mm -hmm. you saw a little, you saw it vanish into the, you know, the engine of this taxiing aircraft, and then coming out of the nose. But it was, it was such a waste. But that's the trouble. You know, you, you deal with, have to deal with all these sorts of things. And knowing where might be the best location to go to is, you know, you really it takes a little while to, you know, to realise or you know to learn where, you know, where do I go? Where, where am I going to get the best shots? You know, from this sort of departure based on runway and weather and all that sort of thing. So yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of an art. All that experience, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah you just, no, no. You just, you know, after a while, you just get to know where to go. Really, it's 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 quite good. Yeah. Um, speaking of like connections, right? Um, so um, we, I, I've personally seen you on the the A220 um, just recently. Um, so um, tell so, me about um, where um, have those connections taken you? Because obviously um, you get um, insights you where you know not many like people get a chance and opportunity for. So um, if you um, want to touch, talk about where those opportunities have taken you. Yeah, well, I mean, this they don't do it so much now. It's in the airport were quite big in. Um, they'd have a, you know media come along to all the inaugural flights that they would have. And generally, as part of that, they would uh, take the, the the media people out to the edge of the runway for the touchdown and, and what have you. And so that was good. And I, I just that was just through you know talking to them, asking them a lot if you could go along a little bit through the Sydney Airport message board at the time, and then I sort of got in contact. A lot of the time, it was really I would just approach people, so I would just you know, call Qantas um, corporate comms and say, you know, I know this event's on, uh, am I able to attend sort of thing? And I get, you know, the more the more presence you have, um, you know, whether that's the number of followers on Instagram or whatever it might be, you know, they're, they're obviously going to be more interested if they can, you know, if you're going to share a whole lot of, you know, photography or whatever with the, the general public. 
So, um, so uh, you know, one part of it is just asking, you know, don't be afraid to ask these questions and see if you can go along. With the A220, I mean, I just, I just emailed Airbus. I, I sort of didn't have any names to, to contact. I just asked a few questions around trying to find out, you know, where would I do, how would I do this? And I ended up contacting Airbus in Singapore. And, you know, to my surprise, they just said, oh, we'd love to have you along, you know, and you go, oh, wow, okay. But, you know, you're really having a, a sort of don't be afraid to talk to people in the industry. So when the 777-200 LR was doing its world tour, I went on board that with Australian Aviation Magazine. They, yeah, they right. took a number of their, you know, invited people along. And I met the captain of that flight. Now, we've, we've stayed in contact since 2005. And, you know, when I went to the Boeing factory just on a normal tour as part of a holiday, he said, oh, let me know and I'll, I'll take you around the factory floor rather than going on the tour that the public would go on. And, you know, that sort of connection. And then when the Dreamliner started happening in 2011-ish, I contacted him in, in Seattle and said, you know, hey, I'd love to get on board the thing when it comes to Sydney. And he made that happen. You know, like he just spoke to the, Mike Bryan, the captain and, and in Auckland and said, hey, when you get there, if, you know, can you look after me sort of thing. So it's you know, trying to, you know, not being afraid to talk to all of these people that you bump into at different things and, and just make a connection and then, you know, make, make, not use people, but, you know, make use of that to ask. And a lot of the time the answer will be yes, you know, you, you can. So, you know, you have to be forward, I think, with that is, is something I've learned about um, how, to, how to get involved in these things. So... Yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, On our yeah. last podcast, we were talking about how important connections are, especially in such a small industry. Um, so um, I'm really glad that you shared your insight on how important and and where you can go with those connections because, you know, getting getting on, on one of those flights would be such a, like, once-in-a-lifetime experience. So I just, there's this, there's this question that, you know, um, a lot of my friends and stuff will be asking. Um, what drives you to wake up early in a cold winter morning to capture that snap of like a rare arrival. Yeah, I know that. Sometimes that's really hard. And I mean, more lately, there's been so many in a row. You know, you have three days in a row where you're getting up, you know, 5.30 in the morning and to get down there, it's cold and what have you. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it is hard. Um, but it's, um, it's like the hunger to get a really good shot. And, I mean, sharing the stuff is great. I mean, I just love the feedback you know, you get from things, whether it be Instagram or Twitter or whatever, you know, people get messages from people saying you know, they, they just can't make it to the airport to see that or they only go to the, the airport every so to so many months or once a year or something. And they, they, you know, they say thank you, you know, for, for posting these photos because they just don't get to see them. So, you know, sharing them and, and the sort of conversations you have around that sharing is, is really important. And I think that's, you know, that's one big motivation uh, in doing it. But uh, it also builds up a, a huge library. I mean, my, my video library of, of clips, you know, they might only be 15 second clip of something taking off or landing or whatever. But, you know, you can use those so many times when you just need a particular thing. And it's the same with photographs, just still images, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of images. Mm -hmm. The important thing there is to have them catalogued in such a way that you can get back to them very, very easily. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it's just a minefield that you have to sort of contend with. So, yeah, be, be organised with all of that. Uh, but, yeah, um, so the, the feedback you get from people about liking the shots or, you know, giving you a little bit of a background sometimes that you didn't know, some, some aspect of that aircraft, maybe historic or whatever, um, is great. And then just being, you know, from a personal satisfaction, just, you know, capturing a really great shot because you take a lot of shots and you go, yeah, these are all right. But, you know, every so often you, you take a cracker shot and that's, there's a lot of satisfaction in getting that shot. Um, this might be yeah, a no, it, question, um, but what would be your favourite shot? Like, will it be, can we find that on Instagram or is it like kept in like a personal folder or something like that? <laughs> oh, it's very hard. You know, the, one of the other shots I was going to have for a background was the, the A350. 1000 demonstrator when it came to Sydney. We were alongside the runway for the takeoff there, and I just happened to get one where it just fills the image completely. And you know, you, you felt, felt you could just you know throw your camera and hit the aircraft. It's that close. Mm. That was that was a fantastic shot. You know, it was the, the focus was good. Everything was good. The framing, the whole lot. So I was really always liked that shot. 
and I had another one of a, a tie from again from the side of the runway, which is that's where the really great great shots come from. But it's very hard to do that. You don't get often you don't often get opportunities to do that. No. But um, yeah, a tie a tie jumbo from behind, you know, rotating and just mm -hmm. the, the hot gases out of the engines and the, the beautiful colours of tie. Yeah, some of those sort of shots. Uh, yeah, um, the ones that sort of stay in your memory, where you'd go and pick if you had to grab. 10 shots that you thought were you, the really good ones that you, you like. But there's so many, and, and what amazes me is, uh, I don't know whether it's just me, but you know, I can, I sort of remember taking all the photographs, even, even though you, you might have you know, several hundred thousand photographs. If you pick one out, you can just put yourself back in that day when you were taking it, and you know what happened that day because of that photograph or something. It, the, the brain's amazing what it can actually um, retain and, and all the details about that shot while you were there. You know, was it just to take a photograph or was it some other story behind it? So, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, particularly like if, from a personal point of view when, and also like you say, going down there to get that shot and then being able to look at it afterwards and be like, I was glad to go there for that moment. It kind of makes it all worthwhile. But also in terms of, like you said, I... I personally, when I know there's like a certain type of aircraft going down, irrespective of what type of day, time of day and whatnot, you just want to be there for like, I suppose that special occasion, particularly when you're talking about aircraft retirements, um, repatriation flights, uh, new aircraft types flying into the airport, just being able to be there. I remember particularly when the VG Airbus A350 came for the first time and just, just being there for that occasion and just being able to see that knowing you're there and just, yeah, just seeing that is just something that motivates you to go and wanting to see it irrespective of what the weather might be like. Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, the Saudi aircraft, the, the four, four visits we've had with Saudi, they, they um, you know, I was really keen to get those because I just love the, the delivery on those. And really the weather was not all that good at most, most times. And the other morning for the fourth one, the sun was out. It, was, it could have gone either way, but the, the clouds cleared and the sun was beautiful. The aircraft just looked spectacular. Yeah. And, you know, you come home and go, wow, that was worth the effort to get that shot. Because if you come home and they're all, you know, very dull shots because there's no sun and, you know, whatever, or it's been raining, it's, you know, they're, they're satisfying, but they, they don't have that sort of um, real, you know, uh, you know, that really tingly feeling of, oh, this is such a good shot. You know, this is really, I'm really happy to have been there. Yeah, no, exactly. I remember, was, was it the day that, uh, it was a horrendous day, it was when, I think OEF left. And I was departing yeah. off one way, um, was it 07? And it was this yeah. horrendous day out. And I remember, and then I saw, I was like, and I remember, I remember seeing the video later that night and I said, oh, that's some, that's some dedication to be there that day. Yeah, I, mean, I was sitting in my car at the base of P3 and it was late. The aircraft was taking forever to get going. And I sat there for two hours in the car. The, the rain was so heavy. That was that really bad rain day. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even hear the radio, the car radio. And then when it was, I was watching on flight radar, when it was ready to taxi out, I just ran from my car up the, up the elevators to the, I only went to the seventh floor because I didn't be outside, it was so wet. And I just shot it taking off from the, uh, the seventh floor there. But you know, like if you don't make the effort to do those things, you don't, you don't, you don't have these shots right, to right. fall back on. So yeah, it was worth every minute of it. And I ended up chatting with the captain online and it was really good, you know, he was, given me a little bit of background information about what happened and the flight and what have you. So it was, you know, it was really good. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I also remember, I think, I remember when I went to go watch, I think OJS was last February last year. And that was delayed for something, for whatever reason, by I think two to three hours. And it ended up departing right on dusk. And I remember hmm. when I was like to my mate, I was like, no, I want to see this because it's it's going to be departing for the final time. And just as you see it, the part overhead, it makes it all worthwhile, even in like a day like that, I suppose. The, the satisfaction and and you'll probably be uh, like and then for you to be able to capture that considering there probably wasn't many other people there doing the same thing and, and be able to show people I think um, is something that a lot of people will appreciate and would have made it worthwhile going home that day. Hmm. I mean and sometimes you know if you were the only one at a particular location you go oh wow I'm, I'm going to be the only person with this shot you know like no one else is there to capture the same the same one they, they could be at a different location but you know generally a lot of people will go to the one place because they know that's the best, the best vantage point. But yeah, knowing that you've got a, you know, a, a unique shot and one that's, you know, not a lot of people will actually have is, is priceless sort of stuff. So, 
yeah, it's it's always good. It's good to know when you know when some of these specials are happening because you know otherwise you, you sort of so you, by chance you might hear about it. Yeah, having a little bit of an insight into that's definitely uh, worthwhile. And the technology. I mean, my we have our own um, ADSB receivers, so we feed flight radar and flight aware and all those systems that people use on their phones. And uh, but we use nice. ourselves. So on on my own phone, I get um, notifications when aircraft are approaching within 250 nautical miles. I can look a map of the airport and it will show me all the aircraft. So typically before this, the virus, you know, you might have 110 aircraft on the ground at any one time. And most of those uh, show as green aircraft. And if there's one there that's red, it means I don't have a photo of it. So we linked link the technology through to my photo album from all of the movement data and it'll just show me those ones. And then the blue ones will be aircraft I don't have a photograph for two years. So there may have been a change of, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a new paint job or a logo or whatever. So, you know, I, I know what to, just looking at the app on my phone, I know exactly what I'm, what else I can pick up apart from something special that I might be after. Yeah, so, the photo, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really useful. And then, you know, when a military aircraft come in quite often, they don't show up on any of the flight radar type things. So, Having your own your own receivers means I can actually see these aircraft and and what have you. The the latest thing we've added is to, um, it it speaks to me. So if I'm at home and I'm racing down to the airport, I can just put my earpods in and it'll just be talking to me, saying where the aircraft is, where it's heading, what altitude it's at, and you know you like, you know where to go. Will I go to the beach? Will I go to Qantas Drive? Wherever you know you can be making decisions while you're driving to the airport because this is telling you exactly what's happening you know, and right down to the extent of you know they're on the glide slope and they're on a, a you know ifr approach uh, on the glide slope or 150 feet below or above or anything like that it's just we've really made use of the technology that's available to yeah. make it easier for me to be in the right place at the right time yeah no far out that's something that's something i wish i had as well no that's yeah that's just be able to see that and uh, know exactly where to go and what not. It's definitely something that I suppose makes your photography a lot more unique and differentiates you from others. Is the fact that you've got that, so you can get those better shots and you know where to go exactly. Um, and that's definitely that's definitely something that would help a lot with that. Um, and I was going to say, do you also have do you have contact with anyone in the tower itself, so you can so you can be okay. This is what runway direction we expect. This is what arrivals we're expecting. This is going to be delayed or something like that. Do you have that sort of connection as well? No, I, I, I have a contact there where uh, more for like if I wanted to use the tower balcony to photograph from, I have a contact there that I could ask. It, it's not as easy these days from a security point of view. They they would years ago they would just let you stand on the balcony and photograph. Today you have to have a, an air services person with you all the time, and that's tricky because they they don't have a lot of staff. So you know to have someone standing there for thirty minutes while you photograph is is not what they want to do. But as far as, you know, movements are concerned, not really, I don't really have connections. And quite often, you know, like that, when I've spoken to some of those guys, they're, it, for them, it's, it's their job, you know, so they're, <laughs> they're more focused on just managing the traffic mm -hmm. than going, oh, there's a Saudi Arabian coming in tomorrow or something like that. I mean, it probably varies from person to person, but that's, that was my general feeling that they don't, because um, when I've asked to go and photograph on the balcony there, they go, oh, what, what, what's happening? You know, what, what are you after sort of thing? Whereas the sort of local Abbey community would have already known the day before or several days before that a particular aircraft was coming in. So, you know, for them, it's a job and it's just day to day managing the traffic. Whereas for me or for a lot of the other photographers around, you know, it's, it's particular aircraft that you're after. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that makes, uh, when I think about it, yeah, they're probably more concerned about managing the air traffic around the airport. And, and I'll, I'll ask you these two questions in terms of the obviously the the photographer. I'm saying particularly over the last few years, the the community in terms of photographers around there have definitely grown a lot. You see everyone, a lot of people doing it now. Um, in terms of those people who are getting into it, particularly those who are on like lower budgets with cameras and stuff like that, what would be your recommendations to them to them and why and what things that like they could do to make themselves either unique or things that you would say as a new photographer, what would you say to them as a piece of advice? Yeah, I mean, when it comes down to camera gear, it's, it's like money's sort of everything, you know, the, the more money you got, the better camera you can afford and better lenses and all of that. But 
at the end of the day, being close to what's going on is, it's, I, I always find that better. I'd rather be taking a very close shot than a, a long distance shot. And, you know, you, you take, you're photographing through a lot of air that can be heat haste or whatever, moisture in the air and it distorts the photo. So getting close up, you know, whether that's going to a fence or just, you know, ships where you're very close to taxiing aircraft and then just doing as much of it as you can. You know, I, I'm still learning every day, you know, different things that I, I'll realise about, you know, whether it's a, a particular function the camera has that I hadn't realised or hadn't made use of, um, or whether it's just, a, you know, an angle you see something and go, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's an interesting angle and look what's in, you know, the background there. So I, I think you, no substitute for taking, just taking photographs, you know, and, and you'll get better at it. I can remember one, one young guy came up to me and he was photographing, but he said, oh, I always chop off their tails or chop off the nose or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just said to him, look, you know, you've got this little dot or something in the centre for your focus. Put that on the engine of the aircraft and just try and hold that on the engine of the aircraft. He, he shot half a dozen shots after that and got the aircraft framed perfectly. So, yeah. you know, it's just little things that, you know, that help. And I guess you, you either learn them, you know, through trial and error or, you know, in that case, I just pointed something out and he went, oh, wow, you know, that is so much easier, so much, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting the shots or getting better shots than what I was getting before. And there's so many young people out there now too. It's really great to see, um, you know, <laughs> young teenagers uh, madly photographing and some really good stuff as well. You know, mm -hmm. people are very creative. Yeah, there's definitely yeah, a lot, lot of um, photos to appreciate out there, that's for sure. Um, and like um, you yeah. said, just practice, practice, and practice, and you'll get better with experience. Mm, absolutely practice that's 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 the key i think you know yeah if you've got better cameras yeah it's, it makes life easier or you know you can get a, a, a top shot but you know you really want to be doing the best with what you've got and being close and just doing it is, is the good thing mm -hmm. okay so um, we'll finish it off with a question from your good friend Mook. Um, um, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> what would you contribute to your success at being an aviation photographer slash journalist? The, the networking for that side of things is just critical. You know, you, you, if you want to have, I mean, people like to see what's going on. I, I think I've found that through Instagram that they, they, they like sort of the newsy things, like this is what happened today. And because I'm retired and I can be at the airport every day, you know, you can sort of have this story of what's going on. And, and people really like that. So making sure you, you know, you've got the connections to get the best shots you can from, you know, whatever, whatever it is, a special aircraft or an event or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. And, you know, like going, uh, I've been lucky to go to some of the Qantas things in Hangar 96 for, um, you know, like the Olympic team coming home. I mean, that was amazing. And really that was just through, you know, having connect you know, or making connections or developing connections with people and, and just asking to, you know, can I go along? That that was incredible. I mean, actually one of the, the rugby seven girls, I got to hold her gold medal from, you know, from Rio. It was like, wow, this is I've never even seen one in my life before. So totally separate to photography, but it was, you know, really a, a, an amazing moment to, to see all these athletes and what have you. Yeah, so connections from the news story point of view, connections is, is just, you know, make them happen. Don't be afraid to talk to people and ask questions and then don't be afraid to ask to be part of, you know, some of these events. I mean, what can they say? They can only say no and then, you know, you exactly. can just ask again another time. Um, but they might say yes and, you know, more than more often, <laughs> you know, the more times you try them, you know, you might get some more yeses and, and that's great. You know, even if you get along to a couple of those things, then you start to get known because that's, you know, once people start to know who you are, that's, that makes a big difference as well. Probably about what it would be for the, the journalists, the sort of newsy thing. I think that's new, you know, news. Having topical things, definitely being consistent and, you know, uh, having posting information all the time and, and what have you. That's, that's one of the keys, I think. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. There's those connections. And like you said, um, the only way you're going to know if you can or not is if you ask. So that's the most important thing. And I suppose, Graham, just just one of the questions I wanted to ask you is why, when, well, I suppose when you're naming yourself on social media, why did you go for 16 Right Media? Oh, all right. Okay. Well, 16 Right's the main runway at Sydney. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, I just, uh, that, I think it was about 2005 when I first did that because I wanted to have a website. So the website was once 
sixright.com. And then as I got more and more into social media, I don't want to just have my name. And one of the, there was two reasons. One, I just didn't want to have my name. But the other one was, once Six Right Media, I mean, it, it sounded to me as though it was more professional. So, I mean, I've set that up as a company with ABN and what have you, which is very helpful with, with doing things as well. Like if you're selling, if you're selling um, images or video to, to people, whether it's news or whoever, a company, um, you know, having a, being set up as a company with an ABN is the only way that you you can get to do that successfully. Um, yeah, so I just thought I'll stay with the one six right and just put media on the end, and it seemed it seemed to work. work, and it's been helpful in getting access to things as well. I'm sure it's, it's contributed to that. Yeah, and I mean the, the funny the funny story about one six right is that when I, in two thousand and five when I did it, it was probably maybe a year later. A Hollywood producer was mm-hmm. made a movie called One Six Right, and it was O N E S I X Right whereas mine was the, the numbers one and six. And when mm. that, that movie was released, all the web traffic searches were going to my website and not his for the movie. <laughs> so, so he wanted to buy my domain name off me and, and I'm glad I didn't sell it and I kept it. But um, I had a redirection on my site, the, like a banner ad going to the one six right, the movie. And yeah, uh, so we've stayed in contact with, with Brian and he's made you know, did another production of uh, National Geographic about uh, air cra- aviation and, you know, the world of commerce and what have you, which was quite good as well. well. We've actually stayed in contact over the years, but um, it was quite funny to have, you know, uh, his website traffic all coming by me <laughs> and I, I probably could have sold it for some nice money, but I thought, no, I'll keep that. I, I like the idea of having one six right. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. No, yeah, there you go. <laughs> it shows you, it just shows you um, what that sort of thing can do. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> one six right media um, flows a lot more so than what a three four left media would or something like that as well. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, no, that's a good good name choice. And yeah, and yeah, I'm sure you're very glad now that you get to keep that because yeah, you're that's essentially what you're synonymous for now and um yeah it just would have been very difficult to find a name that was as good as that i suppose as well yeah. it's funny i was on top of the ridges one time when and this uh, a lady and her son came out and uh, they turned out to be out coming out had come over from perth and the son was you know mad keen aviation photography and he was just madly photographing and she came over to me and she said oh you're one six right are you <laughs> so it wasn't even graham it was just like oh you're one six right and i went yeah that's it. <laughs> her son's you know dying to um, say hello sort of thing but he wasn't brave enough anyway so he and, and so turned after oh, about a year or so he, he came over and uh, so i took him around for a few days and, and showed him all the spots and he's got a you know, like a massive photographs now that he can post on Instagram and he's, he's very good. So I've done that with quite a few people now from Adelaide and Perth and Brisbane and what have you. So, um, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. People are, because, I mean, the guys that I've taken around from Adelaide, you know, they have a movement every 20 minutes over their aircraft. You know, it's, yeah. it's very slow by comparison to Sydney. So they just love coming here and, you know, it's like snap, snap all the time and, Last year, they just happened to be here on the like the three days of uh, westerly winds with runway two five, so they they'd never seen anything like that shooting runway two five off the P three car park, you know, level ten, and the the aircraft are landing below you, sort of thing. It's it's an amazing view to see. Yeah, that. yeah they were really happy with their three days of wind. It was terrible yeah, condition. You, you went home at night, you were just absolutely battered from the weather. The, the yeah. shots you got were great, you know. So, I they really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, that 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 would have been awesome. Yes, yeah, like you said, they've always seen Sydney from the two um, from the main northerly north south runways, and then they come to see that word a treat. So yeah, no, that that must be also one of the things that I suppose is something that's naturally come with you becoming more known is that people aspire to to be like your to take shots like your photography, and then that must be really rewarding. Having those people come up to you and recognise you for your photos and the fact that people obviously really appreciate them as well. Yeah, no, it's excellent. I, I really appreciate them coming and chatting, you know, because some of them say, oh, oh, you know, I didn't want to come and say hello. And you go, why not? Like, just come and say hello. You know, there's nothing nothing bad about that. You know, it's really good. Yeah. One of the, the people, I had another air traffic controller from the UK came out. He contacted me from the UK and said, you know, can I take him around for a day plane spotting sort of thing? 
so I did, and we, we had a great day. He was very interesting. So he, he did, um, uh, he was in air traffic control in London, but he did, or Heathrow, but he does the, uh, the transatlantic stuff, the airways, not coming in and around like Heathrow, but you know, overflowing to Europe. Yeah. Uh, we were down the beach and they were doing the opposite direction parallels that afternoon just by chance. So, you know, taking off in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. And he went, oh my God, what's going on? And he immediately got on the phone to his mates in the tower at Heathrow and said, get onto flight radar and have a look what's going on at Sydney. <laughs> it was quite a, an eye opener. He just never seen that in his, his, yeah, right. his control career. So that was very funny to, to, to see the excitement in his you know, that it was an exciting event as far as he was concerned. But, you know, we don't see it often, but we, when you do see it, you go, oh, yeah, okay, that's, that's interesting. Maybe there's a nice time shot in there somewhere of two aircraft going in opposite directions. But, yeah, he was literally very, very excited about it. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, just by his reaction there and how he showed other people, yeah, that would have given... That definitely would have been an opening experience um, um, but um, in terms of um, the podcast um, uh, just um, running um, to the end of it now so we'd just like to Calvin I'd just like to extend a uh, very extended appreciation uh, thanks for you coming on today we've uh, all thoroughly enjoyed you uh, giving your uh, in, an insight into what it's like to not only be a photographer but how you got there you gave a lot of really good um, input and it was really really uh, interesting to listen to actually I really enjoyed uh, some of the things you said there um, but uh, no, no. thank you and I'm sure a lot of the our, um, our listeners as well will enjoy it as um, well and gain a lot from it because um, a lot of people, especially myself calvin and people listening to this podcast i'm sure really really appreciate what you do and the content you produce so please keep that up because it's it's awesome um, and we um, hope to see some more in the future and and hope for the sakes of not only aviation but for photography that it starts picking up uh, again yeah, thank you for your time today graham we appreciate it once again and, and um, yeah Hope you um, hope the hope starts picking up again and um, you continue what you're doing. So thank you. Perfect. It's been great to chat with you. Oh, awesome. There and, might uh, be some uh, UNSW Seminoles coming, doing some ILSs into Sydney in the next few weeks and months. So <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> it'd be great to get one of those as well. I was photographing <laughs> some of the GA this morning because there was actually I think there's like at least eight GA movements scheduled today into Sydney, and mm -hmm. uh, so I've got them. And you know when I've uh, when I've caught some of those, you know the people have con they've seen it on. Instagram and they contacted me and said, oh, you know, can I get the high res version of that sort of thing? So, and then one person actually told me ahead of time, said, I'm coming at, you know, whatever it was, 10.30 in the morning. And so I tried yeah. to patient. It's very difficult with GA aircraft because they're so small, you know, so you need the longest of lenses, but you don't just, you just don't want to photograph at the airport. You want to photograph the context of what's going on here. And for this young lady, I mean, I got her, landing the archer on one six right and she's got an a380 in the image behind her on the, at the Qantas jet base so it was just you know and even taxi taxi turned around and taxi back up to alpha one to uh, you know Ch uh, was charlie one to take off and you know she's taxiing past 747s and, mm -hmm. and a380 with the jet base so you know you want you needed to get that sort of shot to really show and then the final shot was her climbing out with the tower on, you know below the aircraft sort of thing so for her, that would be wow. quite, she's so excited to have those sort of shots because they just, they just put the context of what she did in, in, you know, in perspective sort of thing. Yeah, I've never seen that. And it's a like challenge that. for me. I just love trying to do that. Yeah, when someone gives me a, oh, you know, can you do this? You go, oh, yeah, that'd be great. You know, like I really want to try that one. So I enjoy it as well. But yeah, no, that, 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 that was, I remember seeing some of those, yeah, they, they do, they, yeah, it just makes me want to go out there and get one of those shots as well, <laughs> because they know they're, they're awesome, yeah, but um, yeah, thanks for your time again, Graham, yeah. and I uh, hope you all, hope everything goes well for you in the future, um, and uh, we really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you very much, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, perfect, thank you very much. All right, no, yeah, thanks, Graham, perfect. Okay, right. we'll catch you later.